evening. Tonight I'm going to share about temple ordinances. For those of you who may be joining who are not members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, don't get all kerfuffled with this little point. Just stick with me because I'm not going to stay on that for the whole hour. I will share some other information. Uh, and the temple ordinance information will not show on your account, but you'll understand just from looking at mine how it would work. So I want to actually share with you that in order to do temple ordinances for an ancestor, you need to have specific information. And it's kind of ironic, I'm going to turn the time back to Yura, who initially shared this information with me. So I think she's the best spokesperson for it. And she's going to share what the minimum requirements are so that we can get a name temple ready. So back to you, Yura. Thank you. Let me just get this set up. Um, so uh, usually when I try to help um, individuals prepare a name for the temple, I, I quickly explain um, what are the five or three to five things that you are um, that you need to prepare a name to take them to the temple. Now, there is a difference, as Sister Latchman has mentioned before, between family history where you're collecting stories, photos, etc., and then the genealogical aspect um, uh, you're gathering names, dates, and facts to prepare them, and, and you can prepare them um, to take them to the temple. Now, there are three main things that you require, and there have been several updates. Um, in the past, uh, people have um, been, a, been a little discouraged because they didn't have the exact name, date, or location of the individual, and um, now the temple will accept uh, some information that might be a little bit more broad, so I just want to go over the specifics. Once again, um, there's a name, a date, and a geographical location. It, now, in terms of the name, there is uh, any type of name will actually work. Um, it could be a nickname, an alternate name. Um, so just a few examples uh, would be, for example, my name is uh, Yura Park, or you could say Miss Park, or daughter of Sung Park, or wife of Christian Leclerc, or Mrs. Leclerc. Any of those names would, um, would constitute as a name. So even if you don't know your grandparents name, you could say, um, if, for example, if you know your father's last name is Park, you could say Mr. Park for your grandfather, um, or Mrs. Park for your grandmother, even if you didn't have their first name. And again, or daughter or son of someone. Another one would be a date. Now you could, it could be a christening, it could be a marriage, a death date, etc. So even if you're not sure when your great grandfather or great um, or grandfather was born, you if you can, if you know roughly that maybe they passed away during the 1900s, for example, you could in, you could include that. Again, it doesn't have to be a specific date. Um, for example, it could be something like. December 24th, 1995, or December 1995, or about 1900, or about 2000, you can just type in the words A-B-O-U-T, about, and it will accept it. The last piece of information, um, oh, and, and in terms of uh, for dates, you can try practicing, um, you can try uh, guessing their game, uh, sorry, guessing dates. Um, so if um, you know that they passed away, perhaps in the you know, recently or in the past little bit, you can try to guess when they might have been born or um, uh, go backwards. If, if their son or daughter was born 1990, you could maybe possibly guess that they were born in the 1800s or around 1880. Um, so uh, again, especially for, for certain records, like I, I think, I believe a lot of Chinese records, they have generations, but not dates. So that's what uh, they'll, they'll do. They'll try to guess, guesstimate. For geographical locations, now political boundaries will change. Um, so as long as you have a rough estimate uh, or I guess uh, where they're located, um, it will be accepted. It could be something as specific as North York or just Toronto or Ontario or Canada. Or for example, um, you know, 200 years ago it would have been York, Canada, West, uh, British colonial America. So names and uh, political boundaries will change parts of Poland can now be Germany or France, et cetera. So um, if you are at least roughly around the, the, the same area, it, it should be fine as long as it's not, you know, halfway across the world or, or whatnot. So once again, just to recap, 
the only three pieces of information that you need to prepare a name for the temple is a name, a date, or a geographical location. And actually, there's actually five. Um, those are the things that I feel like are a little more difficult, um, but you actually do need to specify the gender or else um, you cannot perform any proxy work because you don't know if they're male or female. And then you have to specify if they're living or deceased. Now, this is actually very, very important because this will determine whether um, you can share this information. As Sister Lashman has mentioned before, living individuals, their information will remain private. So if they are living, you cannot share any of that information with anybody in your family or uh, nobody can find that information. But if they are deceased, there is a way to link um, using ID numbers or whatnot. You can link any deceased member to anybody else's tree. So that's just a quick sum up. Uh, oh, a quick summary is you, you need a name, any name, a date can be any date, geographical location, again, specific or generic. Please don't assume the gender and it is important to specify whether they, whether they are living or dead. And remember at any time um, during the process, you can modify this information, whether the ordinances have been completed or have they've started or they haven't because it's all just input into the computer system. Um, this information can always be modified. All right, I think that sums it up. All right, that was really over. good. I liked, your, I liked your presentation. I didn't get a presentation when I first heard it. So this is good. Thank you. Oh, I will also mention um, again on the YouTube channel, um, I did put uh, a, a copy of this presentation that I showed you on one of the playlists. So you can see that content and review it if you'd like. Again, it's on the Toronto, Ontario Stake Temple and Family History YouTube channel. Thank you, Yura. Okay, so here's my uh, screen and I'm going to share a number of things relating to preparing names for temple ordinance work. So the first thing I wanna to touch on is yes, there are three things you need, well five if you consider gender and indicating that they're deceased. And so I wanna show you what um, the family tree looks like and the icons that you can see in the family tree. So here's my tree. Make it a little bit bigger and expand it somewhat. So we can see there's a green icon here, a dark blue icon here. And if you look at the top right of the gray area, there's the option button and if you choose the drop down arrow, that will indicate what those colors mean. So green, available. This person is available to take to the uh, print an ordinance card and take to the temple. Yellow, they need more information before they're ready for temple ordinance. Blue, in progress, means that someone has reserved it and or printed the card and they're actually um, doing the ordinance work right now. So that's under the options tab. Now, another way to view this tree, and I wanted to go back to this view. So on the top left here of my screen, I have landscape. I'm going to choose the fan chart. And I'm on the bottom on this, on this uh, uh, menu here, I'm on the bottom section called ordinances. And as you see on the right hand side, the color code, the system has color coded it already. You can see my particular family. There are green, that means they're available for temple work. And yellow means it still needs some information. You cannot request it. So going back to my landscape view, that's the way I like to look at my tree. I actually want to um, oh, let me go back to um, the landscape view while I'm sorry, my fan chart view while I'm there. We did memory. So I'll go back on the left side here. I'm going to select photos. I showed you this the first or second week, but now that you've actually learned how to ins insert photos, 
you can see the very light orange color, specifically on these two ancestors. And that means there are five to nine photos. Now my grandfather here, Elmer, he's dark orange. That means he has 10 plus photos in his <clears throat> memories. So I just wanted to show you that you can see from the color coding that Family Search does who has photos and who doesn't. So I'll go back to my, I like looking at my family tree and landscape view. So I'm going to talk about the various colors that you see on a person page. So here's one of my ancestors and we're on his person page. And in his um, ordinances, under the ordinances in the toolbar, we see a gray temple. If I select that, I actually go into his ordinance page. Gray means it's completed. And this actually indicates when it was completed and what temple it was completed in. So gray, you can't do anything more. It's already done. The next color I want to explore is the dark blue or the teal. And this is another ancestor of mine. And if we click on his ordinances, it indicates on the top left side that it's in progress. So the first four or five ordinances were completed, but it's the ceiling to spouse that is in progress. It has been printed and my name is next to it. So it was printed by myself and I reserved it on this date and it expires on this date. If you have reserved anything with the temple, it's normally a two year length of time period that you get to keep it reserved. And if you don't print it by that time, or even if you haven't done the ordinances by that time, it defaults back into the family tree and someone else can reserve it. Due to COVID and temples being closed though, they have extended the reservation time period. So the ones that have been reserved are not expiring or they've at least extended the time and I think they've re-extended it. So they're not expiring as they would have in the past. So see 2020, it would normally expire by 2022 and it indicates it's staying until 2023. Okay, the third color I wanna talk about are the yellows, which means they need more information. So going into Alexander, we're going to read that this person's record needs a standardized place of birth, christening, death, burial, cremation, or marriage event. And so if I go back to his details page, I'm going to see, scroll down, that I have a name, but as it indicates, I don't have a date and I don't have a place. So until I can get further information for this individual, I'm unable to do this ordinance work. Now yellow doesn't just mean that you're missing the three vital pieces of information, a name, a date, or a place. It can also mean that there's an error in the way things have gone into the system. So I'm gonna show an example here. This is an ancestor of mine, Ferguson. We only have a last name, last name is Ferguson. See in the life sketch, it was, a, it was an infant, stillborn infant or an infant that died at birth. So we have a name, we have a date and we have a place. So those are the three vital pieces of information. But I want you to take note that sex is unknown. And I'll tell you why that is. Because the two sources that we have that indicate the sex, the first source is a birth record. And it was noted that this infant was female. The second source, which was written the exact same day, is a death record. And whoever wrote that record said that the infant was a male. So I have conflicting information. And as such, I'm trying to find out what gender this infant was. And 
if I cannot find out what gender this infant was, I believe my next action is to do the ordinance twice, once as a female and once as a male. So I'm just trying to find some other documentation if I can as to what the gender of this um, infant was. So that's another reason why the ordinance might be showing as yellow needs more information because the field uh, with the gender has not been filled out. Another reason my, why yellow may be showing, and I'll give you an example, is because the information you have input may not be recognized by the family search program. So here's an example, Mary. She has a name, she has a date, and she has a place. But you notice the place has an exclamation mark next to it. If you look on the top right hand side, I'll open up search help. It actually tells me I'm missing a standardized death place. Now, take note, the ordinance is yellow. I'm going to edit the death location. First, I'm going to fix the date. Delete that zero, put it in again and select the date. Now the place, Trenton, Picton, Nova Scotia. Trenton, Picton, Nova Scotia. I select what family search offers me. I save it. There's no longer an exclamation mark next to the death and watch what's happening up in ordinances. It's refreshing itself, it is now green. Family search didn't recognize the place that had been input. Once I corrected that, this individual's ordinances can now be done. I went through my entire family tree on one line and I did it using the descendancy view of the family tree. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I just went through and I fixed all of these dates and places and I had ancestors that were previously needing more information that were then tempo ready. So I know a lot of times we think we have to add the next name at the top of our tree to find someone to take to the temple, when maybe there's someone already in the system we could take to the temple, but they're not recognizable to the system because of a little error in the program. So take note of those instances also. The third reason someone may not show as ready to take to the temple, and this is an example. Once again, the ordinance is yellow. If you look at when she died, February 20th, 2020, you have to wait at least a year for an ordinance to be done at the temple. And it indicates that when I go into the ordinance page, this person has not been deceased for one year. So in a few more days, we can reserve her name and she'll be eligible for the temple. So those are the reasons why it may show that it needs more information when in fact, you do have information. In fact, she has lots of dates and places listed in her vital information. Okay, the next color I wanna focus on is green. This is my grandfather and this is what green looks like. And if I open up his ordinance tab, I can request all of the ordinances down to ceiling to spouse. The reason I cannot request the ceiling to spouse is because my grandmother is still living as indicated here. So my grandmother is not a member of the church. So if she was, she would just prepare the ordinance card herself and she could have a proxy for my grandfather and those two could be sealed. But at this point in time, waiting to do it on her behalf, um, I can't seal them together until she's deceased. So that's what green looks like. <clears throat> now, how do you find those that are ready to have temple ordinances done? You can go through individual person pages and look for green, or as I showed on the family tree, you can look for green, but there's a faster way. So go to the home page, click on the family search icon on the top left. 
And on the right hand side, under recommended tasks, I have recently been looking at records, trying to put all record hints into my ancestors. Today, I'm going to select tempo. These are all individuals who can have their ordinance cards reserved and or printed and then taken to the temple. I'm going to show more and open up specifically to Charles Shaw. And as I open up his card, I'm going to open him in a new tab. Go up here to Charles. He's definitely available to take to the temple. And I want to uh, show you how I would reserve his name and his card. So first I go into his ordinance tab and they're all available to request. It says that here. It also says it at the top. It doesn't matter which one you touch, it does the same thing. At this point in time, baptism, confirmation, initiatories, endowment, and sealing to parents will all be printed together. The sealing to spouse is printed separately. You can deselect any of these. Put the check mark back on, deselect sealing to spouse, put that back on. And then I would select request. At this point in time, it brings up the church policy, which indicates that if the person was born less than 110 years ago, then I need to obtain permission from the closest living relative. Well, he was born in 1857, which 100 years is 1957 to 1967, so that's far past. Excuse me, another policy is that you're supposed to do your ancestors. You're not supposed to pick random names off the family tree and do them. So I've read that. I click accept. And he's now in progress, which means someone has him reserved. That would be me. Or the cards are printed and the work is being done. It also indicates the date I reserved it and when it will expire. Now, besides going to the home page and selecting an ancestor here, I mean, that is the fastest way to do it. I want to show you the temple tab and what's available for viewing on the temple tab. So this is off any page. I'll show it here off the front page. Let me go into my grandfather's person page so you can see. There's three toolbars. The top toolbar, temple tab, is what I'm referring to. If I open this up, I'm going to go to my reservations. Here they are. So these are individuals that I have reserved temple ordinance work for in the past. And Shaw is who we just, I just gave an example of most recently, Charles Shaw. Let me explain the, the functions or the, the filters on this page. So at this point in time, everyone I've reserved a card for is down the left side. The, the um, if they're being sealed, who they're being sealed to down the center here, the ordinance, that can be done and whether or not it's printed and when it was reserved and when it expires. Now, on the top left here, my reservations, I have 32 total. And I wanna share some on the legend here, if you forget the colors on the right side, you can select the legend and that will indicate quite quickly what the colors mean. I'm gonna close that though and I'm going to open up this filter. Now I'm looking at all, it says that here, but maybe I want to see, I have some cards that I printed and maybe I wanna make sure I have all the cards that I've printed. So I would select printed. 
This now shows me a list of everyone whose card I've printed. I can actually confirm do what, what I have printed and what shows on the system, are they the same total? Or I wanna print some more cards. I could select not printed. These are the individuals I can now print. I'm going to select all again and go to the next filter. Maybe I wanna sort my names. Right now, they're sorted by date reserved. And I like to do it that way because then the one that's going to expire first, I can actually do the ordinance for first. Date reserved and date expired, they're going to be the same because it's always two years. Maybe I wanna sort them by name because maybe I wanna find a specific individual and I can find them fastest by name. So first name, last name, or just name in general but potentially I wanna sort them by sex. The males will show on top and then the females will show near to the bottom. And the reason I might wanna do that is because in my next filter category, maybe the youth are going to the temple and I need to print some baptismal cards. I'm going to deselect the other ordinances and I'm only going to have baptisms now. Now I can see, oh, here's some individuals, females on the bottom, males on the top, that are ready for baptism that I can now print. So here's how, these are the filters. I'm gonna share with you now how you would actually print them. You select them by putting a checkbox beside their name. Say I wanna print three males for baptisms because I've indicated baptisms in this filter. Now, I've selected them. I now need to, uh, where's my print button gone? Moving my zoom out of my focal point here. You know what, I'm gonna close this. Uh, I'm gonna reset my filter, sorry about that. I'm gonna reset my filter and, and then I'll continue. Resetting my filter. I'm gonna close the filters down now. Too many buttons here. Christine? Yes. The print is right under my reservations. Yes, thank you. I see that now. I was there lost for a little bit, but I'm back now. So at this point in time, I've indicated who I would like ordinance cards printed for, and then I select print. I'm not quite sure um, if someone knows what FOR stands for, print FOR, but I wanna print family file cards or name cards anyway. So I'm selecting the top one. At this point, I can still unselect anyone I wish not to print. So say I say, mm, you know what? I don't want these three initiatories. I'm going to unselect them. This leaves me baptisms and confirmations. Then, I would continue. I'm not going to continue because then that would actually go to a print, but I'm going to show you what it looks like on another screen. So I just need to get to my Zoom here. I'm going to stop sharing this screen and I'm going to open up another screen. Another program because you can't see them in the same in the same one. Okay, ordinance cards. So when I hit print, this is what would come up. I would actually see a window that indicates I need to press print. And once I press print, 
this is what's actually going to print out a page like this when I get to cut around the actual ordinance card. Now they ask that you print it on white paper. Don't try to do pink, blue, or yellow. And you get three ordinance cards per piece of paper. So there's three names I can take to the temple. And these were ceilings because it shows two individuals and the word couple is on it. Go back to our screen here. Okay, uh, let me see if I missed anything about temple reservations. Ah, uh, yes. If I wish to share a name with someone, for example, I've done a lot of family history work, but I'm not going to get an opportunity to go to the temple anytime soon. I may wish to share Charles Shaw with someone else. What I do is I select share. I can share it with the temple or I can share it with family and friends. If I share it with the temple, I will demonstrate that. I can still deselect at any time, but I wanna share all of them. So I'm going to share that right now. So Charles Shaw has just gone into temple file. Now I'm gonna go back to Charles Shaw in a minute. Um, Actually, I'll do them right now. I have his tab open here because I knew I was going to use him as, a, an, as, as an example. So I'm going to Charles Shaw's page. Inside his ordinance tab, you can see that his ordinances were shared with the temple right here on February 11th, 2021. But if I go back to the temple reservation page and I have um, shared on the left-hand side here under my reservations, it says three are shared. I can click into that. It tells me what was shared, when it was shared, and if for any reason I want to get that back, I just select it and I unshare it. So until the temple actually prints those cards, you can still retrieve them. So yes, you can share with the temple. And until the temple actually prints the ordinance cards, you can retrieve them back and say, you know what? I changed my mind. I have time. I'm going to do them myself. Or... I'll go to my reservations. I may wish to share them with a friend who can go to the temple sooner than I can. So I select what I wish to share. I go to the top here and select share, share with family or friends. At this point in time, I would put a recipient's name. I used my sister as an example because I did share something with her before. Then I would put in her email address and I would hit send. She would then get an email indicating that I have shared some temple ordinance cards with her and it directs me to go to family search, which is this program. Upon entering family search, I would then go to my communications box. I'll show you where that is again. Up on the top right over here are communications with individuals and I would click on that seeing I have a new message and it would say, BJ or myself, Christine Latchman, wishes to share these ordinance cards with you and you have to accept them or decline them. And I actually have done this before. And once you share them with a family or friend, you cannot retrieve them. They can send them back to you, but unlike sharing them with the temple, you can't say, oh, I changed my mind and bring them back. That's not possible. All right, the last thing I want to share with you is unreserve. So if you've reserved these, and you can see I have 31 reserved, 31 reserved. If you've reserved a number and then you say to yourself, you know what, I'm not gonna get to these, let someone else have an opportunity to take them. You just select which ones you want to unreserve, select it and unreserve. His name, it was Charles, has now left my box. 
I had 31, I now have 29. And if I go back to his page here on the top right and I refresh his screen, bring it up to date, I can see that it's green and anyone can request it now. These temple ordinances can be requested again. So it's a little bit of, of information, but it's actually quite simple to do and it works really, really well. Now, if you just want to be random about who you take to the temple and you don't want to just look through all these names and select a person, on the left hand side is a category called ordinances ready. If you select that, then you can select an ordinance you'd like to print cards for. So if I select baptism and confirmation, it gives you four. What it does, it selects names from your family tree, from your reservation box and your family tree. And if it's exhausted all that are available, it then pulls names that have been shared with the temple by other people. So baptism and confirmation, I'm going to, excuse me, that it's not what I wanted to do. Go over here. I close this window. I'm just showing you initiatories. We'll print five names. And at any time you can unselect a name, select it back. So five initiatory names will come up. Endowments will bring up one name only. Sealing to parents will bring up 10 names. And sealing, sorry, sealing to spouse will bring up 10 names and sealing to parents will bring up five names. So this is just a very quick way to grab some names and not be specific about who it is you're grabbing. I'm going to share another screen with you now little back and forth tonight. Okay. So you may ask, who am I supposed to do temple work for? And I'll read this. This is from an Ensign article that was published in January of 2018. Some mistakenly believe that we are only responsible to do family history and temple work for our direct line ancestors. However, and here's a key point, cousins are also part of our family. We should feel comfortable extending warm family ties to provide family history and temple work for them. And here's an example. Aunt Mary usually stuck to her direct line. So it's sometimes possible now to find temple opportunities by looking at cousin lines. Note that for six generations, there are approximately 63 direct line ancestors versus 38,000 cousins. And then once again, using the descendancy view on family search can simplify this process. So who are my cousins exactly? They are brothers and sisters of our direct line ancestors and descendants of them. What about spouses of our direct line ancestors? We should do temple work for the spouses of direct line ancestors. Then leave the temple work for the ancestors of those spouses to their direct line descendants. Family history at your fingertips. I wanted to let you know that everything is not done on the computer. With cell phones, anything's possible. So did you know that you can access family search on your cell phone? And here's what the app looks like. It's actually divided into two parts. The family search tree is one app. And then if you wish to add photos and other memories, you have to download a second app. It's all free and those are the names of the apps. And I'd like to share something fun with you before I continue on my presentation tonight. 
And I know you're all muted, but hopefully you're laughing. I thought this was so funny when I first saw it. Okay, back to my presentation here. Okay, we're going to now do a little bit of housekeeping before I show you some other things that are available on Family Search besides just this family tree. Last week, or the week prior, I'm losing track of my weeks, I shared with you how to upload a photo of an ancestor and make it their profile photo next to their name. So that week I was having problems, not, it wasn't really a problem. I forgot to move my photos from my desktop, which I always work off and put it on my laptop, which I have to use because it has the camera for Zoom. So I uploaded a picture that wasn't even his, it's another, family. So I have to take it off. So I wanted to show you how to do that. So what you do is you, you hover right over his photo and you select it or click on it. And at this point, you can edit the portrait, replace the portrait or remove the portrait. So I'm going to remove the portrait. I just wanted to show you how easy it is. Remove the portrait. So now he just gets a, a little blue silhouette in there. Um, okay, that was my last housekeeping bit. Now I'm going to share with you some other things you can do on family search besides just the family tree. So looking at the toolbar, you have the family tree, you can search records and other items. The wiki is a whole other seminar, but if you really are trying to find an ancestor and can't locate them through all of the records, go to the wiki. Memories we talked about. Indexing is available. Taking uh, an image of a record and actually transcribing what you visually see so that it's digital and we can all search it. Now, and then temple, we looked at the temple tab today. Activities. I'm going to show you all activities, but within all activities are these other categories. So all activities. These are fun family history activities to do, especially if you have younger members in your family who find you know, data entry and, and looking up records might be a little bit boring or challenging. You can have fun with, with your children and your grandchildren using these family history activities. So looking at the first one, where am I from? Once you go inside this tab, there's actually um, four other categories. So these are eight generations of my family. I know that looking at the bottom toolbar and I have 110 ancestors, 75 of those ancestors are from the UK, six are from Germany and 29 are right here in North America. And, and I can move this timeline bar and, and zoom in on the map and, and get more details. But I wanna talk about my heritage. So up here, I'm gonna select this tab just to show you what Family Search will do for you. This is my heritage broken down by country and percentages. And my family lines, I'm going to expand my family tree and just watch on the map where we go. So this is my dad's side of the family. And as I continue, by the time I get up to this point, you can see that on the map, we've sprung back to Europe. We're no longer in North America. So that's something fun to do. So going back to activities tab, all activities, I'm going to show you famous relatives. Now, some people get a little discouraged saying, I can't find anybody in my family tree and or I'm not related to anybody important. Well, believe me, you are. I looked at this last night for the first time and I discovered I'm related distantly to two US presidents. And as I scroll down, these are church leaders. I'm related to these individuals, distantly, I must say, and church pioneers. 
and there's a whole slew of them. So giving an example, I'm going to go to Andrew Johnson. And once it opens up, I'll make it a little bit smaller because it is quite lengthy. You can see all the way back here, we're linked. And then you have to come all the way down this line and there I am related. So you can see what famous people you're related to. The next category I wanna share with you is called All About Me. So this is taking information about you in terms of the year you're born and I was born in 69 and where you're from and it's got different categories. So the meaning of my name, my name popularity, my heritage, where does my name come from? It indicates here some information. Um, popular song of the year, this was 1969, Sugar, 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 mm, Honey, Honey. Okay. Um, so I noticed as I was looking at this that most of the categories dealt with US like, oh, gallon of gas in 69 was only 34 cents. So um, this is all very interesting, but I just wanted to highlight up here where it says United States English, I actually put in Canada and chose English and it brought up slightly different categories and Disappointingly, not as many. So instead of US stats like Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, um, we don't see that when I actually select Canada. It has more top, top news in Canada was actually quite boring compared to that. It was the Official Languages Act making French and English equal. Okay, going back to something that is uh, a little more fun. activities, all activities. I want to share with you, record my story. Um, I will tell you that um, compare a face, you put a photo of yourself into the system, and then it compares with all the other memories that you have put in or someone else have put in about your ancestors. And it sees if your face is comparable and percentage wise, how close you are to a certain ancestor. I did that one time and it brought me to my great grandmother. It said I looked most like my great grandmother. Record a story. I think this is a great category. And whether or not you use it on family search, you can take the information here and do it on your own computer and keep it very private. So let's pick a category. I'm going to pick ponder and reflect. And once I open up a category, then there are a number of questions that you can respond to about yourself. So the top left, what is the nicest thing someone has done for you? So when I open that, if I press this red button and if my laptop had a microphone, I could actually verbally give my answer and record a story here. Or I can type a response right here. As I say, if it's something that you don't wish to make, this is private because you are a living person. This is still private. But once you are uh, deceased and the system knows that, then this would be made public. But as I said, you could take these same questions and do something on your, on your own, on your computer. So there's lots of great um, questions in each of these categories. I think it's a great way to write your life story. And the final um, activity that I will show you here, and there are lots more to uh, look through, is picture my heritage. So once again, you have to upload, you have to upload a photo of yourself, and then your photo appears in the categories that are indicated here. So I am, according to Family Search and my ancestors, seven percent Irish. So then there would be a picture of me and I could see myself in an Irish outfit, 20% um, American. I'm not 20% American. I 
have 20% American cousins, 46% um, Canadian, and so on. So you can see yourself in different outfits and how you would look. So it's fun for the children, or as I say, the younger generation. So that is my presentation for this evening. Hopefully it made sense and I didn't go too fast for you. But once again, there's a recording so you can review it.